I'm on? Okay. All right. Good evening. All right, everybody's on. Mm, I love it. Everybody's all charged up, ready to worship. Good. Heavenly Father, we just come before you, Lord. We give you this night. We give you the praise, the honor, the glory that's through your name, Lord. Fill us with your Holy Spirit, Lord, as we continue and study the book of Acts. And, Lord, tonight we're going to focus on heaven. There's so many things going on. With everybody's rushing around with Christmas and everything. I think we need to get our perspective back to heaven, Lord. And so I just pray you just be with us and fill our hearts and um, just lead us here in Jesus' name. Amen. I can only imagine what it will be like when I walk by your side. I can only imagine what my eyes will see when your face is before me. I can only imagine, yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees I fall? Will I sing hallelujah, or I'll be able to speak at all? I can only imagine, yeah, I can only imagine. I can only imagine when that day comes and I find myself standing in the sun. I can only imagine when all I will do is forever, forever worship you. I can only imagine, I can only imagine yeah. Surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel? Will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still? Will I stand in your presence, or to my knees I fall? Will I sing hallelujah, or I'll be able to speak at all? I can only imagine, oh. I can only imagine, I can only imagine, yeah, yeah, I can only imagine, surrounded by your glory, what will my heart feel, will I dance for you, Jesus, or in awe of you be still, will I stand in your presence, or to my knees I fall, will I sing hallelujah? Will I be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Oh, I can only imagine. I can only imagine. Yeah, yeah. I can only imagine. I can only imagine, I, I can only imagine, I can only imagine, yeah, yeah, I can only imagine, I can only imagine when all I will do is forever. Forever worship you, I can only imagine. Amen. 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 Give him the glory, man. You know, we can, it's going to be a wonderful time. <laughs> Amen. Matter of fact, it says in Isaiah 65, verse 17, For behold, I create new heavens and a new earth, and the former shall be 
remembered, I will not, former shall not be remembered, it says, <laughs> or come to mind, but be, but be glad and rejoice forever in what I create. For behold, I create Jerusalem as, as a rejoicing and her people a joy. I will rejoice in Jerusalem and joy in my people. The voice of weeping shall no longer be heard in her, nor the voice of crying. Amen, huh? Yep, that's what it's going to be like. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice All the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light Darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice Trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. All will see how great. How great is our God. H to H he stands. Time is in his hands, the beginning and the end, beginning and the end. God had three in one, Father, Spirit, and Son, the Lion and the Lamb, Lion and the Lamb. How great! Is our God sing with me? How great is our God? All will see how great, how great is our God, how great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Sing that again. Name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing, how great is our God. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. One more time. How great is our God. Sing with me, how great is our God. All will see how great, how great is our God. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior 
God to thee. How great thou art. How great thou art. How great is our God. Sing with me how great is our God. Almost see how great, how great is our God. I see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole Sing that again. I see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled. The whole earth is filled, and the whole earth is filled with His glory. Holy, 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 holy. Seated on the throne, exalted, and the train of his robe fills the temple with glory, and the whole earth is filled, and the whole His glory, holy, 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 holy is the Lord. Holy. Oh. 
see the Lord seated on the throne, exalted. the land, worthy is the land, you are holy, holy, are you Lord God Almighty, worthy is the land, worthy is the land, amen. Is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, you are holy, holy, are you Lord God Almighty, worthy is the Lamb, worthy is the Lamb, amen, worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Worthy is the Lamb. Worthy is the Lamb. Amen. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Thank you. You are so worthy to be praised. Father, we just give you all glory. Come now. Come, Holy Spirit. We ask for your presence upon our life right now. Fill us. Empower us. Strengthen us. Thank you, Father God, for your presence and your goodness. We give you all praise, honor, and glory. And I pray, Father God, that you would be with Pastor Jerry as he comes now, and if there be a special anointing upon him, Lord, and as he speaks to us, and Father, I thank you and I praise you and give you all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Greet someone.
Christ. Go ahead, yes, yes, yes. Well, which one is working? Which one's the one that I'm supposed to be talking into? Am I good to move this away? How is that? I don't like microphones in my face. Freaks me out, like lizards in caves. <laughs> and of course there's an echo. We've got to try to fix that. Okay, listen, you know what? The enemy's given his last lick, certainly, for years, close it out. He doesn't want people to be into God's word. We're going to see what happens if you just stay faithful. Anyways, Sunday, special service. We're doing something a little different for services. Uh, so don't miss out on Sunday. It's our Christmas celebration on Sunday. Okay, we're doing... Like I said, I'm not going to share everything, but we're doing something a little different this week um, for our celebration of the birth of Jesus. And so see you Sunday. Don't miss it. Uh, we're in Acts chapter 5 tonight. Is everybody there? Ready to go? Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for all that you are doing in our own church. You're a good God. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. No? It's working. Wonderful. Upon the church. With the sudden and jolting deaths of Ananias and Sapphira, we looked at that on Sunday, Luke now gives us a great picture of how the Holy Spirit moved among the church after that. Verse 12 of chapter 5 is where we start tonight. And through the hands of the apostles, many signs and wonders were done among The apostles continue to go to the temple every day, and God continues to move mightily in the early church. A couple weeks ago, was Solomon's porch or colonnade? Uh, several thousand, and we know uh, just from ancient drawings and things how big it was, but we know, you know, 3,000 people came to faith there. Uh, came to faith here when they healed uh, the, the man who was um, uh, crippled there. So it, it's a big area. A lot of people gather there. Stop there. Sorry. Thanks for being so patient, people at home. Now, though, thousands of people are gathering there. New believers. Think about the picture here. These are new believers now who are coming to the temple every day and worshiping Yahweh and praising Jesus as their Lord and their Savior. And, and the, if there's any picture of an apple cart being upset, this is it. And we're going to find out what happens because a very deep impression had been made upon the people and it helped greatly to spread the gospel in the early church. You think about it, God-fearing Jews and Gentiles are now coming together to worship God and the conversation, the praises, you know, when, when the uh, sacrifices, I'm just going to kind of give some liberty here as to what was probably going on because we know that these, they would come together during the times of prayer and sacrifices, say the afternoon sacrifice would be given and the uh, non-believers would be there like, you know, thank you, thank you, Yahweh, and the new, the new believers and the Christians would be like, yes, thank you that Jesus, you're the lamb that takes away the sin of the world. Thank you for this picture you've given us for a couple thousand years of how your death would, would pay the final price for all of our sins once and for all, you know, and that would stop people. <laughs> Excuse me, what did you just say? You know, and there's, so there's conversations. There's people getting saved. However, not 
Everyone was taking part, it would seem. Verse 13, yet none of the rest dared join them, but the people esteemed them highly. Although it was obvious that something was going on, there were those uh, who simply stood back and they would not join the festivities. The word join there uh, in the Greek is more accurately defined as uh, come near. So they wouldn't come very near to, to the Christians and the believers there. And they were keeping their distance from them, watching from afar. You know, these were the non-believing Jews who were either choosing to reject Jesus as the Messiah or they were fearful of the temple authorities. So they stayed away so that they would not really have any trouble uh, upon them. They just wanted to worship. They just wanted to come. But they were fascinated. John Sott said that the presence of the living God, whether manifest through preaching or miracles or both, is alarming to some and appealing to others. Some are frightened away while others are drawn to faith. You know, it tells us that you know, the people wouldn't join them, but they they esteemed them highly. They, so they were like, that's cool. I respect what's going on. Do I believe that? No, maybe that's good for them, but, you know, or they're just having fear of the temple authorities. Uh, and interesting, because I, I've thought about that over the years. You know, and the kind of the comments that get made here every Sunday, if you work the door, uh, you know, and greeting, and, and if you've seen that, you see, we always have new people all the time. And there are times in my spirit where I have sensed somebody has come in among us that is not a believer um, somehow they made it in, and, and the message that day was something very pointed, very very clear. Heaven, hell, sin, you know, wages of sin being death. And there are times, as a pastor, I do sense that in my spirit, people that won't be back. You know, and I have seen people get up and walk out during times when we've been in the Gospels, you know, speaking of of those deeper issues and you know they don't come back in the service now i can't say it that's always because of preaching but that is a, a reality in the modern church today in the modern world people they're just they're, it's it's good to a certain point and then well no you know now there's been a string in the heart that's been plucked or as the book of acts pricked and people are like no i don't want that part of me to bleed right now i want to deal with that later in my life Listen, we must never forget that there are those around us who choose to reject Jesus. We know that. However, there are some who do not come near due to fear of what their peers may say or do. Jesus said in John chapter 7, verses 37 through 39, If anyone thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He who believes in me, as the scripture has said, out of his heart will flow rivers of living water. But this he spoke concerning the Spirit whom those believing in him would receive. Listen, this uh, was the fu being fulfilled there at the Temple Mount during the time of the early church. When Jesus spoke, was happening as the apostles spoke about Jesus, worshiped Jesus. Christian, I, I really believe that if we are faithful to serve God and we are open and honest about our love for Jesus, that he will continually draw the lost to himself through his church, through us, through the work, through our testimony, through our open and honest worship of him. Because of the mighty workings of the Holy Spirit through the apostles, though, the faithfulness of the believers there to worship openly, here we get to see the results of that. Look at verse 14. And believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Make a note of that. Increasingly added to the Lord. Multitudes of both men and women I love how the Bible puts that in there. A uh, the good, vast majority of the Bible is very men-centric. That's just the way it is. You know, God has his order of creation and all that. But whenever we read of women in the Bible, there's, there's great women of the Bible, great women of the faith. But, you know, the Holy Spirit anticipates things and anticipated that there would be those one day who would say, well, the Bible's just sexist and chauvinist. No, it's not. Not at all. In fact, the Holy Spirit inserts for us here that men and women were being saved. And that is significant because the men and the women were typically separated there on the Temple Mount. So the gospel was not just going through the men and it was up to them to go talk to their wives. The, the women were also very active 
in the church at this time. Let that be a lesson for y'all. Both of us, men and women, need to be active in the church. So they were increasingly added to the Lord so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at, the, at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also, a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem, bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits, and they were all here healed. You know, let's face it, folks. <laughs> Isn't this a passage... Isn't a passage like this the reason why we love to read the book of Acts? I mean, isn't this uh, something deep inside of us when we read these passages? We just long to see God do this. Well, after church, I'm going to give out some handkerchiefs. And you can take them home and wave them in front of you. I've touched them. I've cast my shadow upon them. I've put a light on and I watch. <laughs> Listen. These were miracles. I'm going to explain a little bit about what was happening with, with Peter there. People were getting delivered left and right from all manner of sickness and demon possession. Peter simply walked by the people lying there in the streets and people, they're, they're in hopes of being healed and God honors that. This is very interesting because this was a superstition from the pagans of that day. They were very much into uh, symbols and objects to, for healing and stuff like that. Magical powers were said to reside in shadows and objects that were you know, very common. This was common belief among the Gentiles. If you remember, where, where do we see an example of this in the, in the Gospels? The woman with the issue of blood. All she wanted to do was touch the hem of Jesus' garment. This explains the, the motivation of the people coming out in this manner to be healed. However, many were no doubt hearing the gospel. Let's keep this in mind because we've already been told the context of this. They're being healed, but God is adding to the church. People didn't just get healed and say, I'm a Christian now. No, they heard the gospel as a part of being healed, as a part of, you know, remember the, the, the model had been set. Silver and gold, I have none, but what I do have, I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise and walk. That was probably what the apostles, the disciples, everybody was saying. And when Peter would walk by the people and they would get healed, I'm sure that the rest of the disciples were swooping right in there to make sure the people heard the gospel. You know, guys, that's the model that we have for, for Christmas. We did the Christmas, come out and get a pr Christmas present. Yay, but you're going to hear the gospel. You know, the candy cane, this is what it really means. You know, sharing the gospel, asking the children and the parents in this room after, you know, after they've gathered here and watching, you know, eight or ten of them or so raise their hands to receive Christ, parents and children alike. Well, the miracles are great, but it's by faith that we're saved, by faith that we're healed. God met them, met them in their need, and the growth of the church was staggering at this time. The bottom line is this. Jesus will come down to man's level, if only to show his compassion and reveal his glory. But his desire is to heal from the curse of sin above all else. One thing that really stands out in this passage to me is how great the need was for people to be healed. We saw that with Jesus in his ministry, right? There's always people, thousands of people, just needing healing, needing to be delivered from demons. You know, we read these stories and we're like, what in the world was going on? The devil was going on. The curse was going on. Sickness was going on. It was at an all-time high at that time. But this is not uncommon. You can go to countries in this world today and see this level. We've been to Nepal. We've been to the leper colony. I've been to, to Thailand and been to villages and seen people sick. I mean, it, it happens everywhere. And if you follow the stories of the great missionaries and, and even our modern missionaries, God is doing a work and healing is part of it. Again, I reject the notion or the doctrine, rather, that some believe the gifts uh, have ceased for today. I reject that because I've seen people healed. I've been healed. Amen. Trusting God that my wife will get healed right now. Amen. I know many of you are trusting God for healing 
in the various areas of your life. It doesn't make your faith any less or anything like that. We don't teach or believe anything like that. God will do it in his time for his glory. And he'll make sure, and I believe this, he'll make sure that someone learns about Jesus through what he does with you. But it's, it still astounds me at how many people needed to be healed. Question. How much do we want to see God heal and save people in our city? I believe that unless people recognize their great need to be saved, that we're not really going to see as many come to faith as we could. That's one of the things we need to start really focusing our prayer on, and I think we're going to focus our prayer in 2021 um, on, on that. Lord, make people realize their great need for you. We want to see people saved. We pray for people to get saved. We pray for God to, to pour out his spirit and save the lost around us. But really, we need to kind of do some laser focusing of our prayers here. We need those around us, those in our city, those in our family, those in our jobs. We need people to begin to really recognize their need for a savior. And I made the mistake tonight of watching the news while I ate dinner and we're pretty ripe for people to start realizing their need for a savior. I mean, my goodness, it is all going to Hades in a handbasket here. I mean, they're excited about the vaccine, but now people are dying from the vaccine. Two nurses have died and several others are having in the hospital with severe anaphylactic shock. You know, I mean, it's like, so every time you turn around, it's like the other shoe drops. How many shoes does the devil have for crying out loud? Fear is just pouring out upon the people right now. People are just, they're, they're, they're crushed right now with fear. I, I, I really hope, I, when I was eating dinner tonight and I was watching the news and several stories and, you know, businesses that are, that are crushed right now. And now business owners that took the loans uh, earlier in the year to try to stay afloat for the first and second shutdown. Now the third shutdown is wiping them out and they're all receiving a tax bill. They owe a portion of it back, what they were given for stimulus for their businesses back in, in March and April. And they're like, how in the world? I mean, this world is just getting crushed. But God's going to use it. That was my prayer tonight. Lord, how bad is this going to get? What are we going to do as a church? I mean what I said last week. We may start, start having to have a couple of meals a week as a church and just gathering so that everybody can get food in their stomach. You know, some prayer, some time of, of healing. I, I don't know what the next year is going to look like. I love that meme. That Was it you that posted that, the Willy Wonka one? It's like, y'all, I don't see anybody, anybody posted about how 2021 is going to be my year. Are y'all scared? It's like, yeah, the world is scared. We were going, I was thinking about going into 2020. We were like, 2020 vision. Oh, this is the year. God's going to move. Uh, I suggest to you that he certainly did. <laughs> Maybe not in the way that many thought he was. I know that he has. We're going to see more of this. Again, we need to just pray that God would stir hearts and reveal the great need for him among the lost. Again, verse 14, though, believers were increasingly added to the Lord. Notice what it says that, what it says there. We often read verses earlier in the book of Acts and later you know, added, people were added to the church or you know, we read about those who are being saved. But here in verse 14, it's very particular. And believers were increasingly added to who? The to the Lord. See, I think I even made the mistake earlier of saying the church. Yes, they're added to the church, but please note that. It's important. Jesus is the head of the church. The lost were coming to faith in Jesus and being added to him. When we pray for God to add to the church, we need to make sure we give proper glory to Jesus because it's to the body of Christ that they are coming to. You see, we have all our little Christianese language that we use, don't we? You know, oh, you know, members of the body of Christ. Doesn't that just sound so Christian? Well, let me ask you, are we ready for the Lord to add to himself those whom he is saving? Are we ready for the messiness of revival? 
Are we ready to see wretched sinners come to Jesus and start walking a new life with him? You see, that means if they come to Christ and they start walking in Jesus, guess what? They're going to be walking right next to us. They're going to be walking and sitting right next to you. I, I can think of the stories over the years of, you know, why gossip is such a bad, bad thing in a church and rumors and all those types of things. And think about, you know, the, you know that person that you know has come to church. And like, what are they doing here? You know, the old phrase, like, like, I didn't think they'd ever darken the door of church. You know, it's like, well, you know what? Some people are going to walk from the dark into the light. And they're going to be um, sitting here and among us. They're going to be with us. She's right here. She's right here. Keep coming. And the daughter's like. <laughs> she went back in the room. See, we're family on Thursday nights. Was... I'm watching, by the way. Just The back door's locked and everything. Don't worry. But yeah, are we, re- are we really ready for that? Because when we start praying for God to save, you know, people like our leaders, and for all intents and purposes, our new leaders. When we pray, we need to pray. God, please save. I'll let any of our esteemed leaders, if they happen to be in Los Angeles, they they can have a seat right there in church. And you all better be praising Jesus and looking, looking to Jesus and opening your Bibles. Don't be staring at them. I always, that's one of my things. I always wonder, is some celebrity, you know, going to roll into this church one day because they're down here filming, but they're, they, they want to just find a church on a weekend, you know? I, that'd be cool. Anyway. In chapter 4, the religious leaders rose up and tried to stop the work of God by arresting Peter and John after he, the healing of the lame man. After they preached the gospel with power to the high priest and the temple leaders, they were let off, <clears throat> remember, with a stern, stern warning. Don't do it again. Don't preach in this name anymore. So they went home. They prayed. God shook the house. So in the morning, they got right back up, went to the temple, and started preaching in the name of Jesus, and God kept saving. When Ananias and Sapphira lied to God about the price of some land that they had sold, when they donated just some of it but piously claimed that they gave it all, it didn't end well for them. And after that incident, the church grew rapidly, as we now that we're seeing here, many great miracles and signs and wonders. God was honoring the believer's willingness to give all to him, so he was giving all of himself to the church. But whenever there's a great move of God, the devil is certainly not happy. Look at verse 17. Then the high priest rose up, and all those who were with him, which is the sect of the Sadducees, and they were filled with with indignation and laid their hands on the apostles and put them in the common prison. The high priest was actually the father, um, a father and son-in-law combo of Annas and Caiaphas. We know that from several other passages in the scripture. These are the same guys. Don't forget this. It's important. These are the same guys, the same group of people that sentenced or condemned Jesus to death. The sect of the Sadducees, because it's only it's been less than two months since Jesus is dead. The sect of the Sadducees, that's uh, important to note as well. It's a political wing of the priests who are totally and only concerned with the status quo uh, of the relationship between Israel and Rome. They wanted to... They wanted to just have peace so that they could have all their material wealth. They were very much into uh, that. They denied the resurrection. They denied any miracles. They weren't into that. So they are now mentioned as being part of what is going on here. Note also, back in chapter 4, when Peter and John were brought before, and the the lame man, and they were brought before, and this whole dialogue uh, Ensued. It says that the high priests and the, the Pharisees and leaders and stuff uh, were greatly disturbed. But now we have made the leap from being greatly disturbed to filled with indignation. The Greek word for indignation means envy or punitive anger. 
So they are, they are hopping mad. They are now, they are beside themselves with anger that these guys and more, notice how the Holy Spirit inserts that in between four and five. There's more now. And they're preaching in the name of Jesus. So these guys are mad. They're looking for any way they can to, the, to crush the disciples once and for all. Along with Peter, there's probably quite a few people that were arrested here, but it would only be for the night, as it turned out. Look at verse 19. But at night, an angel of the Lord opened the prison doors and brought them out and said, Go stand in the temple and speak to the people all the words of this life. I love that phrase. And when they heard that, they entered the temple early in the morning and taught. But the high priest and those with him came and called the council together with all the elders of the children of Israel and sent to the prison to have them brought. Okay, so they're all settled for the night now in jail. <laughs> or, and an angel comes. The, the high priest and his family and all the Sadducees the Pharisees and the group of people, they had all settled in for the night in their homes with great excitement about the next day, how they were going to stop this rebellion. Well, the angel of the Lord comes, changes everything. He lets them out of prison. And not only does he let them out, he tells them to go and keep teaching in the temple. Remember what the prayer was when we saw the apostles last? Lord, you're the God of heaven and earth. They recognized that he commanded all the angels and he commanded all the waves and wind and sea. God was in control of it all and they prayed for the boldness to continue to preach. Well, I'll tell you what, if an angel came to you and gave you a direct command, right, that's, that's an answer to prayer. Because now there's no excuse to have the supernatural start happening in that way. So they gladly obey the angel and continue to disobey the authorities. And note those words what the angel told them. Go and speak to the people all the words of this life. You know, what a great principle for us. We have been set free from the prison of sin. The angel of the Lord, Jesus himself, the, the, the God of very God, the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity died and rose again and he commissioned all of us to go forth in boldness and make disciples in the nations. We were set free from the prison of sin and we have now living in us the words of life, the words of this life. We have the gospel we have the church. Note, there is a difference here. There is a very distinct phrasing here. This life. It's the life that Jesus came to offer, the life more abundantly that Jesus came to offer, but it's also the life of the community and the fellowship of the koinonia uh, that we have as believers that gather together to serve the Lord together, to serve one another together. The angel tells them, go back and preach. Preach the name of Jesus. Preach the gospel and preach to those who are still imprisoned in their fear and lost in their sin, that there is life in Jesus. There is life in his church. Come out of old religion or dead religion and into new life through Jesus Christ. If we are set free, though, we must obey God and go preach to others while they are still imprisoned. The apostles are just preaching away as the authorities come and gather into their chambers and smugly call for the prisoners to go be fetched. It's just business as usual for them, I guess, but they're about to be surprised. Verse 22. And when the officers came and did not find them in the prison, they returned and reported saying, indeed, we found the prison shut securely and the guards standing outside before the doors but when we opened them, we found no one inside. Now, when the high priest and the captain of the temple and the chief priest heard these things, they wondered what the outcome would be. So one came and told them, saying, Look, the men whom you put in prison are standing in the temple and preaching or, and, and teaching the people. You know, the report comes back that 
they go to get them and they're not there. And notice the detail. You know, they show up, like, good morning. And the guards are there, good morning. You know, we come to get the prisoners. Oh, no problem. And they start unlocking all the doors. And they go, they go in there and no one's there. Okay, we missed it when it said the angel of the Lord let them out. Now we understand it wasn't, you know, people didn't fall asleep. It wasn't an earthquake. The chains didn't fall off. They were removed. They were able to, we don't even know how. The Lord doesn't even tell us how. The Holy Spirit doesn't even tell us how. We are just to understand and believe that they were there at night, the doors were locked, the guards were set, and in the morning they were no longer there, and they were told to go preach the words of this life. You guys, what happened to Jesus? He was placed in the tomb, the stone was locked into place, the guards were set, and in the morning... The doors were open and he was gone. Also note that the captain of the guard is involved here. The captain of the guard was also sent to go get Jesus to bring to these guys once. And when he showed up there, Jesus disappeared among their midst, among the, the crowd. And they couldn't. And then when they went back and they're like, why didn't you arrest him? And they're like, uh, well, one time they couldn't find him. Another time they're like, we're not going to get involved there. He's just, his teaching is amazing. You know, this is interesting. Can't wait to find out how that happened. Because later, when Peter's released from prison, he just walks right on out and goes home. Clearly, it's a supernatural event. The authorities are beginning to sense this. I would love to see their faces on the Jewish leaders. When they hear the second bit of news, look at verse 26. Then the captain went with the officers and brought them without violence, for they feared the people lest they be stoned. And when they had brought them, they set them before the council, and the high priest asked them, saying, Did we not strictly command you not to teach in this name? And look, you have filled Jerusalem with your doctrine and intend to bring this man's blood on us. You know, it's an interesting approach that they use now. They calmly come to escort the apostles away, fearing that the people may react violently. The tide's beginning to turn, and it reveals really the truth about the authorities now. They're losing control over the common people, and they are fearful of losing everything. The apostles now, as they're brought before the council and the high priest, they're reminded of their agreement, <laughs> one-sided, of course, not to preach Jesus to people there at the temple. But of course, the apostles never agreed to any such thing. Also, as we progress through the book of Acts, note here, the authorities did not even say the name of Jesus. Now it's this name or Teach, speak about this man, this man's blood. Don't, didn't we command you strictly not to teach in this name? They won't even say the name of Jesus. Listen, people can try to avoid the name of Jesus, but they will never avoid the power of Jesus. The power of Jesus is clearly seen here by the religious leaders' admission that the apostles had filled Jerusalem with their doctrine. This is a great testimony of the effectiveness of the gospel when it's fully preached. Man, I long for the day when people out there say, like, oh, Calvary Chapel? You know, San Pedro? Oh, man, those, they are just really into the Bible there. I was like, I, I, I've been there a couple of times. All they do is just teach the Bible. It's like, what else are you expecting? We're just teaching God's word. We're preaching the name of Jesus so that souls might get saved. But now these guys, they're like, whoa. You know, you're filling Jerusalem. That tells you the extent. Listen, if 5,000 people got saved at one sermon that Peter preached, how many other thousands were still talking about it? This is... 
This is the world is being turned upside down, as the Book of Acts will later say. It's really being turned right side up, doctrinally. But next they cry out that they do not want the blood of Jesus upon them. Really? How quickly they had forgotten that in their hatred of Jesus, at the prospect of Pilate letting him go, they cried out in Matthew 27, 25, let his blood be upon us and our children. That, that was the length they were willing to go to make sure that Jesus was murdered by their demand upon a weak politician who just bended and folded to their will. They cried out, you know, basically, <clears throat> no other terms. Pilate, whatever it takes to kill him, will we'll take the responsibility of his blood as long as you just crucify him. And Pilate did. And indeed, the blood of Jesus is on their hands. And they desperately want to be free from any accountability or responsibility for the death of Jesus. Yet here they are, beginning to plot the murder of Jesus' disciples now. His evil knows no bounds, you guys. The same men who are successful in putting Christ, or getting Christ on the cross, are now, have not learned any lesson. Their hearts have become hardened even more. And they're willing to murder more you know, the high priest had, had even declared it's expedient that just one man die for the salvation of the nation. And he spoke prophetically, the scripture tells us, but now they've thrown even that out of the window. And they're willing to kill however many it takes. Like Pilate's really going to listen to their nonsense. Which basically is what happened because in a couple of chapters we're going to see them pick up stones and take care and do it themselves. To Stephen. <clears throat> Think about it. They don't want Jesus' blood on them, yet they fail to realize that it's the very blood of Jesus that will save them from their sins. And that speaks to all of us. The blood of Jesus is still causing this reaction today among the world. Men and women fall into two camps. They have either made peace with Jesus and received forgiveness or they are desperately doing everything they can to be free from the guilt of sin. They will either pay the price or apply the payment to Christ's account for their sin. Verse 29. But Peter and the other apostles answered and said, we ought to obey God rather than men. You know, they simply respond by stating that they're going to obey God no matter what. They're not going to stop preaching the name of Jesus. They've been commissioned by the name of Jesus, by Jesus Christ himself. Remember Peter's sermon in chapter 4? This Jesus, whom you know. You know, he, he, I love how he throws those. We wonder why it says their hearts were pricked. It's because Peter knew exactly where to stab them. You know, this Jesus, whom you know. And now they're saying, we're going to obey God and not men. We will preach in this name. And once again, they're going to preach the gospel to these guys in this room. We'll look at that in a second. But this verse, oh boy, this verse has been the verse, the opposite side of the coin for 2020. Churches have divided over this verse and Romans chapter 13. You know, the, when, it, when they said no church, when they said close the church, when they said you can't have church, you know, it's almost immediate. The church just like lined up on two sides of a river. And I've had discussions with people and, and I've had discussions and, and meetings with Calvary Chapel Association uh, here with all the pastors in the Los Angeles region. We're all trying our best to just keep our churches open and do. Many churches have closed. I mentioned that a few, a few weeks back. But it all came down to we're going to obey God and not man. And the other side was Romans 13. Obey the authorities. Let me ask you the question. It's Romans 13, but it's also uh, 2 Peter. Who, who's the one who said this statement? P 
Peter. Peter is well aware of what it means to obey the government and to obey the authorities where you need to and to not obey and obey God rather than man. So, you know, we, we're going to take our cue from Peter. Now, have they told us don't preach the name of Jesus? No. So we've tried to have a nice balance and we're wearing our masks and we're doing all the best that we can and we are respecting the authorities you know even though it was um you know covid you still paid your taxes how nice of the government to give you till june this year to do it instead but this you know it's interesting to me which is it we are going to obey god or are we going to obey man well the scripture tells us to obey god no matter what and there are some lines that have been crossed. There are some infringements that have been crossed. And praise God that the Supreme Court has begun ruling in our favor as a church. And it's amazing. I did have somebody try to say, well, you know, it's still in the, in the county protocols. And it's like, well, they didn't change it. They're hoping that ignorant people won't, you know, pay attention. I, I read the transcripts of the Supreme Court. I read, I read the, 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 the main body of the decision. I received a, well, it's kind of confidential. Just Let's just say I have a, a friend who is uh, an officer here in the city, and I was forwarded an email from, from LAPD uh, Legal Affairs just so I can read it for myself. LAPD's official position is they will not be enforcing any stay-at-home orders against religious institutions. And it notes in there as they are exempt under the Constitution and the um, most recent Supreme Court ruling. So rest assured, our government that we respect and honor and obey to the best of our ability is in our corner as well for the most part, our, our enforcing uh, local. So we don't need to worry about anybody coming in here to tell us we can't have church. So, and if they do, well, game on. Because I'm ready. Don't hit me up while I'm reading the book of Acts. You can hit me up if I'm in like the Old Testament or something, and I'll be like, well, I don't know, I'll bring a couple of ephos to Newsom or something. I don't No, don't hit me up when I'm in the book of Acts. <laughs> That's, you know, this is like fuel. Lord, we thank you. Thank you, Father, that you've taken care of us and protected us. Thank you that Sunday mornings are so packed that I even get a little nervous that we're too close. Lord, you're, you're just good. And we're so thankful. Continue to grow. Lord, I pray Sunday is packed as we celebrate Christmas and people sense and know that they need to come to church for Christmas, you know, celebration, Lord. I pray that the gospel goes out on Sunday, too. Just thank you, Lord. You're good. Well, Peter's going to preach now. The God of our fathers raised up Jesus, whom you murdered by hanging on a tree. You know, in the Hebrew mind, hanging somebody on a tree was the ultimate picture of cursing somebody. But even God and his curses would go so far. Remember the ruling, a body needed to be removed before sundown. And that's exactly what happened with Jesus, the Passover lamb. Him God exalted to the right hand, to his right hand to be the prince and savior. To give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. And we are his witnesses to these things. And so also is the Holy Spirit whom God has given to those who obey him. Real briefly, the gospel is distilled down to its very essence for them, and it certainly applies to everyone of all ages and for all ages. Jesus is the Messiah. He's telling them that. You guys, he's the Messiah. God raised him up. You killed him. God, it didn't work. He's now exalted and sitting at the right hand of God. He's the prince. He's the heir to the throne. He is the savior of the world. Titles, again, from Daniel and Isaiah used, just as Peter did in chapter 4. And he is willing, willing to grant repentance to all of Israel and forgiveness of sins. 
And Peter says, we stand here today as witnesses to all these things, and we are telling you, we will obey God and not men. If you obey God, you will receive salvation. He is the Messiah, the Son of God, the Son of Man, Son of David. He is the giver of life, and he saves from death. Jesus died. Jesus rose and was exalted. Jesus offers repentance to all who will believe. The Holy Spirit will fill them with the power to believe if they will repent and come to Jesus. This is our message. That's the gospel. This is what we preach to every creature. Verse 33, And when they heard this, they were furious, and they plotted to kill them. It's the second time they read that. Then one of the council stood up, a Pharisee named Gamaliel, a teacher of the law held in respect by the people and commanded them to make to put the apostles outside for a little while. And he said to them, men of Israel, take heed to yourselves what you intend to do regarding these men. The high priest and the leaders, of course, explode with rage. But then we see a highly respected Pharisee from among them rise up and give some very wise counsel. Gamaliel, we know a little bit about him um, from history, from the writings of Josephus specifically and some of the Talmud. Gamaliel was uh, what was referred to as a rab or a rabban. Uh, it's different than a rabbi. He was a rabbi to rabbis. So he was a top rabbi. He was known to have taught from 22 to 25 AD before sitting on the high council as we see him here. The apostle Paul states in Acts 22 that he had sat under Gamaliel in his youth. You know, remember the book of Acts is like 35 years of time. So later, several years, a decade or more later, Paul would reference the fact that he sat under Gamaliel. So also, in the way the Holy Spirit's kind of laying out the book of Acts at this stage, and, and Saul is going to make an entrance in two chapters from now, pretty much right after this, uh, you guys, it's very possible, it's most likely that Saul, Paul, was sitting there during this and we just haven't been introduced to him yet. Because if he was a student of Gamaliel, then he would have been sitting there next to his rabbi, his teacher, his, his most respected one. He'd been around for a while, it appears, and he'd certainly seen movements come and go. And I do wonder if he was around, because this is only two months later, I just... I wonder if he was around during the trials of Jesus and maybe sat back and just didn't say anything. But he'd seen some movements come and go. Look what he says. For some time ago, Theotis rose up, claiming to be somebody. A number of men, about 400, joined him. He was slain, and all who obeyed him were scattered and came to nothing. After this man, Judas of Galilee rose up in the days of the census and drew away many people after him. Well, he also perished, and all who obeyed him were dispersed. And now I say to you, keep away from these men and let them alone. For if this plan or this work is of men, it will come to nothing. But if it is of God, you cannot overthrow it, lest you even be found to fight against God. Now, Gamaliel cites two particular men who led uprisings over the years. Theodos was probably some messianic pretender or claimed to be a messiah. Uh, we don't know really much about him, really anything about him. So it's even, even more true to the words of Gamaliel. This guy, remember him? Yeah, I didn't think you did, but, you know, that guy. I mean, his memory is just gone. So we don't even have anything in antiquity about him. Uh, Judas of Galilee, we actually do know a little bit about uh, from the writings of Josephus. He died around 6 AD, after stirring many people to rise against the Romans uh, due to a census being required uh, by Caesar Augustus. Uh, there's some debate among scholars, but it's generally believed this is not the same census that brought Mary and Joseph to Bethlehem. This would have been some years later. It was a more of a taxing uh, census. In both of these cases, though, these men were killed and their followers lacked the true grit to keep the dream alive. The followers, there was a remnant of followers after um, Judas of Galilee. Can anybody 
take a guess as to somebody else in the New Testament that probably followed him in that movement? Well, who? Yeah, Simon. Simon the Zealot. Ze the Zealots were ones, when, it, when somebody was named a Zealot then, it typically meant at one of these uprisings. So it's a good chance since it was from the Galilee area, Simon would have been one of the guys who had been a part of that or at least followed that ideology, and then now he had come to Christ. So think about it. Simon's around now. Oh, I remember that guy. My goodness, I almost lost my whole future and destiny I'm so glad I found Christ and I'm no longer a zealot for, you know, against Rome. Now I want to see Rome saved. Now, Gamaliel's point is very wise and very true. If it's just of men and men's flesh, it's going to die. But if it's truly of God, there's nothing and no one that can stop it. It's simply not wise to fight against God. Oh, man. There's so much application there. Even in our own personal lives, the works of the flesh versus the works of the spirit. If it's a work of the flesh in our lives, it's going to die. It's not going to give us any life. It's not going to avail much in our future as we walk with Christ. It's the works of the spirit that are going to last forever. And when it came to the gospel, he was right. Leave him alone. God has a way of shutting these things down, but it's not of him. Another prophecy spoken by a wise Hebrew because the gospel continued to go and it continued to flourish. The people were still on fire for God and 2,000 years later, we're still preaching the same gospel and we're reading these stories like we're right there with the wind blowing in our hair the fire of the Holy Spirit breathing as the apostles are preaching the gospel. At least that's how I get it when I read the Bible. I hope you do too. Many today certainly have no fear of God and they've taken their stand against him. So just pray. Pray for those who oppose God and fight against God. It's not going to end well for them if they don't repent. One would wonder, really, what did Gamaliel make of all this? We don't read any, really anything else of him. A, a wise man, a head and leader of Israel. I sure hope he repented. I sure hope he really took these things to heart. I, I have to wonder if, if Paul would later interact with him. Because he gave wise counsel. It shows that his heart was at least inclined to see Yahweh not be interfered with if he was make, doing a move. So he left the door open. Let's just hope that the Lord stepped through that door for him, just like countless others through down, down through history. But his protection of the apostles only went so far, verse 40, and they agreed with him. And when they had called for the apostles and beaten them, they commanded that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. So they departed from the presence of the council, rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house, they did not cease teaching and preaching Jesus as the Christ, the Messiah. So cooler heads did prevail. Nothing changed. Nothing stopped the move of God. Even though they took a beating, and let's just be clear about this. You know, you get this picture if you read it quickly that they just kind of like, you know, took a shoe out and just kind of beat them and said, get out of here. You know, it's, the word beating there uh, it means skinned in the Greek. They, they stripped them down and they gave them 39 save one. Their backs were skinned and torn. For the gospel. They, they suffered for the name of Jesus. And this is the first time we really read that they suffered. You know, it was jail and before that, but now it's now it's physical. This did got, get me to start thinking. You know, we need to continue on. And we don't know how bad things are gonna get. We don't know what can change with an administration. We don't know things are going, what are going to happen. Our friends in Nepal and 
India and places around the world, you know, the gospel is, is getting darker and darker. The light would appear to be going out in some places of the world, yet the Christians are thriving. They're still serving God, even though they're in prison, being beaten. Iran, I mean, we've had many stories of what's happened there. North Korea. Uh, we have no right or claim to say, well, this is America. It never could happen here. It could happen tomorrow. We never can be assured that this won't happen to us. When I read history, I like history. Thinking about the way governments take over. If you're, if you're familiar with World War II history, if you're familiar with Hitler and his rise to power. You know, he was chancellor, man of the year in 1938 on Time Magazine, you know, because he was reforming Germany. And then came the Night of a Thousand Knives, in which he simultaneously murdered every person in Germany that was opposed to him, every person in parliament, every person, they just killed them all overnight. And the next morning, the Germans woke up and had to begin to say, Hail Hitler. And, and that was what brought the world to war. We don't know, but the gospel must still go forward. Our lives, our testimony, we must still go, no matter what they say, we must go where the Lord tells us and preach to the people the words of this life. We, we must remember that. It's not about our personal comfort. It's not about our uh, living that life of being comfortable and having all that we have. We have been called as ambassadors of the kingdom of God. We have been called to be a part of the work of God that he is doing in this world. There was a little section towards the end of Sunday's sermon that I put together today and I was just crying in my office realizing what it is. You guys are Thursday, you get the preview. You know, it's just we look at the birth of Christ but never forget that without the birth of Christ we could never have the second coming of Christ. We would never have him. He's coming again. Not as a child but as a conqueror. You know, not as a servant, but a sovereign. He's, he's coming again. We have to remember that. And while we wait for him, we are to occupy until he comes. That was the words of Jesus. I will I go to prepare a place for you. I will come again and receive you so that where I am, you will be with me also. But until then, occupy until I come. Keep one eye on heaven and one eye on those who need to enter the kingdom. The door has been made wide open. We are the church of Philadelphia. God has put before us an open door. Imagine that. There is nothing that we can't do through Christ Jesus to advance the kingdom and the gospel. And we get to partner with God in sharing the gospel with the lost. I cannot wait for this new year to come on. But we're going to keep celebrating even as this year keeps going. But some of us might have to suffer a little bit. But the comfort in that is knowing that Paul has already taught us if one of us suffers, we all do. That's a whole sermon in itself. I don't think we share in the suffering as much as we should and could with our brothers and sisters in this world who are meeting under fear or penalty of death. Father, I thank you for the work that you have done, the work you are doing, and the 
opportunity we have to do it with you. Please be with your church. Please be with your people. Please help us not walk away from these stories and let them just remain stories. Let them truly be the words of this life that stir and burn in our hearts as we go forth to bring life to this world. Look forward to Sunday. Lord, fill this house on Sunday, both services. May we see people come to faith today or Sunday and may we see your church, your people rise up and have no fear and come to celebrate. We thank you for that open door, Lord, and we give it back to you and admit to you. You have opened the door for us, but we will remain with the door open for you to come and go as you please and lead us in and out as you promised you would as the good shepherd. We thank you and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, go forth with Christ, and uh, we'll see you Sunday. We're gonna oh we're gonna start right on time because we're not we're gonna do announcements and then start because of the way the service is gonna be so be on time okay all right.